we have in order South Korea, Jamie S. Rich, Ariella Christantina, Brian K. Vaughan, uh, we've got Sarah Kenny, Alison Sampson, and James Cope at the ends. Welcome everyone. Thank you for coming along as well. Pleasure to have you here. So, this is the Creating Worlds panel, and essentially we're looking at the idea of when you first make a comic, what's actually going through your mind? What are you trying to build, and how are you building it? Um, what, what's, do you start with the characters, do you start with the plot, do you start with the narrative? Where, where are you actually going, how are you making it come to life on the page? So, with that in mind, the very first thing, whenever you want to make a new story, you're sat there and you're staring at a blank screen. Almost all of you, I think, looking at a blank screen, or a blank piece of paper, perhaps. Where do you actually start? What's the first point for you? Do you start with plot, character, world, concept, idea, theme? What is it for you that kicks off a story? Sorry. Is that like the longest version of where do you get your ideas from? <laughs> uh, okay, um, is there an order here? Should we just all, like, what do you want to do? Uh, I think the order is basically there's two microphones, so just pass it down this uh, is very quickly for me, it's never about uh, the bomb from the blue, the kind of moment of divine inspiration. It's more like a, an accretion of um, interests, obsessions, uh, little twiddles of character, twiddles of plot, which you put together. It's, it's very boring, it's that simple. And um, sometimes you'll have a moment where, hey, that half idea seems to fit quite well with that half idea in a way that makes them better than some of their parts. More often it's, I have half an idea and I'm going to stare at it and bleed from my face until it feels like a whole idea. And, and yeah, I think, uh, we like to mythologize the, the process of imagination, but actually it's just an awful lot of thinking and hard work and, and sort of being uncomfortable until you hit something that works. The problem solving seems to be 90% of my sort of world problem situation. Yeah, I would say similar, but I do occasionally get that bolt from the blue. I, I sometimes just have a scene that I want to do, and then I have to figure out what that scene fits into, and everything comes out of that. But other times it's just maybe pushing characters around like their chess pieces until they sort of fit together and beginning from there. But I would say character is often the most where I start from, and then the world builds around them. So it's, it's a little bit different because we got the script from the writer and how we create the world from their imagination is kind of interesting because you kind of have to immerse yourself in their, in their imagination, sort of. And sometimes, sometimes they have photo reference, sometimes they don't. Um, or ask them to sketch something that will be interesting to see also. And I think... Well, my piece is mostly based on Victorian uh, era, so uh, I Google, and that helps me to create world. I think that's uh, world building is really hard, and so like everything that's hard, I just make the artist do it. And uh, I like starting with why am I telling this story? What am I confused about in the world? And then. I like characters, I think about that next, but world building always comes very last for me. It seems like whenever you start with world building, it's because it's the most fun thing to think about. It's, it's usually the least fun thing for the audience. I think like, if you have characters that people care about, they'll fill in the gaps and want to know more about the world, but the world building should always come almost last, in my opinion. Yeah, it's interesting to say that, because I definitely um, start with my character first. And then I think about sort of, you know, what are the problems that they're facing, you know, what type of person they are, and then the sort of the world brings um, builds around them. Um, certainly with Surgeon X, I started with the character of a surgeon and thinking about her being in a future world, and then, you know, there's what sort of obstacles would she face, and that's when, you know, I sort of had the antibiotic crisis and that was thrown at her. But interestingly, I find music, like when I'm listening to music, that's a really big part of how I come up with ideas and I kind of listen to sort of a whole range of music from electronic to 
whatever. And it's amazing how much, when you're listening to music, it can trigger thoughts and ideas and sort of scenes even. I find that quite sort of inspirational. Um, well, I'm working with Steve Niles, or I've just fin we've just finished our book. And the question for me was like, what is horror? And what is my take on it? And what do I want? And Steve, Steve's been doing this stuff a long time. So what I wanted to make was, what is it to me that I can bring to what we're doing? And I, I think there's no dark without light. And so I wanted to think, who are these people? Who are these real people who have this experience? And so I sort of dig into my life a bit and um, look at the world. But the fact, the fact is, I'm, I'm an artist as well, the world you create does not exist until you put, it does not exist anywhere until you put pen to paper. And then, it doesn't exist in your imagination either. It only exists as what you draw, end of. And so if you don't, it's whatever you draw, not what you think. And so what effectively, you say, where does the world come from? It comes out at the end of your pen, which is kind of hard. And um, that's it, really. Uh, it sounds, sounds kind of weird, but as an architect, that's what we do. And um, yeah, that's where the world comes from. You have to draw it. Everyone's answer is so much better than mine. <laughs> I, I usually just do, like, a, I'll think of an absurd situation, and usually the comic springs out of that. Like, a, I, did a, I did a little short called Murder Bullets, and it started out with uh, this big red moose chained to a toilet, and this other guy kind of flipping out around him. And then I kind of backtracked and tried to figure out how that situation got to be, and the story kind of revolved around right that, so it's, I'm very more haphazard, I never really think of anything else. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have to pass it back, I'm going to start with James next time, it's going to be fun, yes. At the end, someone gets a present. Um, so, um, artists first, but also writers, this might come in for yourselves as well. When you're first building the, the world on the page, you've got perhaps a story, you've got perhaps some characters, but nothing's real until it's been drawn and designed. Um, um, James, Alison, uh, uh, Ariella, what's your design process? Like, when you're seeing a script from someone and they say, this is going to be set in Victorian London, or this is going to be set in, you know, um, a Winnebago graveyard, whatever that is. Um, when you get something like that, how would you actually start processing that, designing that world and like creating it to life? And then writers, when you receive that, how does that influence the story you're then telling? I usually don't have that problem just because I write most of my own stuff, so it's it's whatever I want to draw most of the time, so if I just want to draw fish people, I'll draw a comic about fish people. <laughs> so. And I do. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the scripts I get are normally pretty, um, I was going to say concise, and quite often I don't get told where the story is set. I mean, with Winnebago Graveyard, initially it was Texas, but Texas is a big place and can be probably just about anything you want. So what I did was, the first thing we did on the job was draw, I drew four big pages of illustrations where I just decided what we were going to do. This is before Steve had written it. Oh, before there was any script, I drew, drew, I decided the settings and I drew the characters and then sort of quite a lot of detail and then I just gave it back to Steve and then he wrote the script and um, I didn't really, I've never been to Texas and I wasn't really quite sure what it was like and um, but you know we have the internet and um, and I drew some things and the book came out of that. The Winnebago Graveyard, I did not know what it was until I got the script where I had to draw it. Um, which, if I'd known, I might not have been quite so keen. But anyway, I did it. Um, well, I've already written one comic, Surgeon X, and um, I got to work with the brilliant John Watkiss, and um, we did a spin-off, a 10-page spin-off, and I got to work with Royal Police. And uh, one thing I found as a writer is that, you know, you have all these ideas, but then the artist sort of does their thing, and they take it to a whole other level. And the joy, you know, from a writer's perspective, is to see what their interpretation is going to be. And often they'll do something quite different or they'll put you know, a twist on it. And it's actually a really exciting moment for a writer to get it back and then kind of look at it and go, I wasn't expecting that, that's brilliant. And 
you know, it, sometimes you have conversations about stuff when you get, get the artwork back, but normally my experience has been excellent, thanks for taking it to another level. So it's, it's, a, brilliant, it's a brilliant experience as a writer to see you know, the artist doing that for you. Yeah, I would never be able to write prose novels because I'm spectacularly lazy. And I, I love getting to work with an artist like Fiona Staples. And I just said, this guy's got horns, and this lady's got wings. Just make them three-dimensional and lived in. And uh, she does that. But I'm really jealous of writer artists like uh, James. And uh, I always I have a pet peeve in world building about coming up with new kinds of currency. Where it's always like credits or space dollars or something. But I don't know if you guys have read Orkstein, but their currency there is involved in uh, severed penises, right? Slices of severed penises, and it's just so weird and lived in and specific. Uh, I just think it's genius, but I, I don't have the imagination for that. So I have to work with artists to come up with perverted strangeness like that. So well done. Um, for me, because I really love environment or background, and I've worked with um, Justin Jordan before, uh, Deep State of State, uh, this place in New York, I usually go and scout on the internet to find the actual building that he mentioned. Uh, because people live there, and I don't want to just create, let's say, Justin said, Federal Bureau Investigation Building. I don't want to just create a random 12-story building when it's not that, because people what do we do? And if she said, let's just draw whatever, then I'll go draw whatever. But at least I know how the building looks like in that period of time. Um, when I worked with Brian Woods for Rebels, I did the same thing, because I think it's, uh, no, I forgot what the year is. A civil war, I think. And um, I scoured the internet for weapons, uh, uniforms, even, I think, carriage at that era, <laughs> because I, well, for me it's important, and then if I if I have to create uh, a random building, at least I know where to start. That's for me. It's it's funny because the joke always is is that as a writer, uh, I can say so. The band is playing to a uh, club full of people, and they're all there dancing, and I'm done. That's all I have to say, and then the artist has to spend however many hours drawing all of that. Uh, I tend to write less than when I know who I'm working with because I know what they can do and will tend to cater scenes towards what they can do and I've been lucky to have collaborators who enjoy that and want me to say less. Um, I've read other people's scripts including this guy next to me and if he was saying it's a crowd full of people he'd be like and over in the corner there's a girl with glasses that might be important later and next to her is a big crowd full of uh, guys with baseball caps on and over here are some guys looking at their phone and, you know, and in the middle there's a slide projector and he describes it all and then says, not to give away your secrets, or you know, whatever else you come up with, so. Yeah, it's, uh, it's gonna depend on the collaboration, right? I mean, there's gonna be, there's gonna be writer, artist collaborations where, uh, as Jamie says, you know, I'm usually quite wordy and that's, that's all as a result, by the way, of having grown up scripts I disappeared nearly. like anybody ever read an Alan Moore script it's like uh, three pages for every panel and he'll just it's like this beautiful avuncular letter to somebody he loves where he just goes into detail about stuff that really doesn't matter and oh so uh, top left of the panel there's a white butterfly circling gently through a dusty sunbeam and of course in Greek mythology we all know that a butterfly represents the soul leaving the body so it's very important that the butterfly is facing east rather than west and it just goes on and on but it's all in all capitals <laughs> so, so it's like you're being shouted at by somebody who's really really irritated. anyway uh, the point is, if I'm working with an artist I've never worked with before, I'll probably be that wordy, I'll probably be that tyrannical. But, as Jamie says, there's always the little caveat at the bottom, which I don't mean. If you want to do it your own way, you absolutely should. No, 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 do it my way. <laughs> Up until you've worked with an artist more than once. As soon as you can trust your artist, you find yourself saying, well, hey, it's not just my job to build this world. I get to be reactive as well as proactive. I get to say, I'm going to leave the details of this scene a little bit more vague. And if you create an amazing character, who knows, in a couple of issues' time, that character's going to be super important. And the funny little thing that you designed to go on the end of their arm might be a major plot point. And you end up having these wonderful back and forths where 
stuff that comes entirely from your <laughs> your bitch. If you want to be really mean about it, the artist is always your bitch. You know, do what I say. It's just not true. Very quickly, the artist will turn around and make it their story, and you realise that it's better than it would have been if they'd done it your way. Um, one of more proactive roles in comics is the role of an editor, which, Jamie, you're currently working with uh, Young Animal and Don's to Miracle and books like that. Uh, I want to suppose to everyone, but your answer is going to be interesting, especially, I think. Is it very difficult when you're in this sort of process of building up the world and you suddenly get focused on one little detail? It doesn't matter particularly, but it's something that you just start thinking, how does this actually build up? How does this work? Like, you know, if everyone lives in a giant spire, then where do the toilets go? Or if, like, the world's only run by, there's only women in the world, who runs Belgium? Who runs Argentina? Who's the most powerful person? Is it very difficult to get stuck in that sort of logic spiral and then have to think out of it, but actually, no, that's not the story. Here's the story. Uh, there we go. Uh, yeah, I don't know, I'm not sure how, I, that I have ever gotten really hung up on that kind of stuff. My feeling is, is as, an editor or as a writer, if you know your characters and your story well enough that there's a certain instinct level that you can operate on to where if someone throws out a question to you about it that you probably have an answer. If you know how your character is going to act and in, in general if someone throws a situation at you, you probably can react as they would. Um, I did a book called A Boy and a Girl with Natalie Norg. There we go, this one works. Uh, that was set in the future and Natalie and I sat down and she would ask me questions like, well, what's religion like in this future and what's the currency? And I hadn't thought about it, but it was very easy for me to go like, oh, well, yeah, probably if there's AI, they don't believe in religion that much. So why don't we put a church in it that is, a, is now sort of a historical site but no one uses it for anything important and that became a scene. So it's just sort of sometimes, as he says, that collaboration back and forth, you never quite know what's gonna happen. And, as an editor, my job is to make sure you don't get stuck on that and to move you along because you've got 20 more pages to write and, and the toilet scene is probably not going to be that important. Sorry, I just broke my phone. Um, so, um, um, Ariella, uh, as well, uh, from the artist's perspective, sorry, I'm just skip this to the side entirely. Um, from your perspective, do you ever put things into your character designs that only you know why they're there. Like, uh, if you're drawing someone who's in the Victorian era, do you think, oh, they're, these two are a couple, they're wearing the same sort of clothes each other, or do you, do you try and put little story ideas into your design work ever? Is there anything that comes to mind for you for that? Wow, that's interesting. Um, so far, I think, I, I'm, I'm pretty, I try to draw as close as I can to the script. Um, when it comes to creating characters, then I can add something, and but usually I still ask the writers, like, uh, like when we are doing the second villain for the second arc, and Marguerite actually asked me, it's like, what do you want to draw for the villain? And then I said, I was sketching random monster at the time, I don't know why, and I'm just like, what about her? I just, just draw a snake lady, it looks like Medusa. And then Marguerite took it and then made it to something else, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but as for buildings and everything else, if the character moves around, like if they're chasing uh, one another, then I will do something. I will make a map, usually. And just kind of like, oh, this building is over here, that building is over there. So they're moving from point A to point B. So I know where everything is. That's probably only I know that, and maybe the, the writers wouldn't know that when I put the building over there. But it's it's good when, uh, as the artist, you know the anchor point. I'm gonna get technical and work. Like what the anchor point for every character is, and the camera moves in your head to help tell the stories. But I don't think I ever put like any Easter egg, maybe <laughs> in the last arc because. I don't want to give any spoilers, but that's uh, based on a painting, a famous painting in Indonesia, then I put it there. 
like probably people from Indonesia will know that. The color is also from Indonesia, so she knows that. But maybe Margaret doesn't, or my editor doesn't. But that's okay. That, that's interesting, the idea of you building the, the, the map. Um, um, Brian, uh, for yourself, obviously, Saga is a bit of a big world to, to the building, being everything. Do you have anything like that stored up, or just, do you work with Fiona on that? Do you have like a map of these characters are on this planet, these characters are on this planet, and here's how you know their, their journey works, and here's how I can get from one place to another. Do you have that? Do you keep those sort of things in mind, or do you just go, what's best for story? Actually, more for uh, Paper Girls, the comic I do with Cliff Chang, that we really wanted to do a kind of hard science fiction version of time travel. We wanted to take everything into account, you know, like, uh, in fact, if you were really going to go back in time an hour, uh, the Earth isn't where it was an hour ago, so you would actually be floating in deep space. The time travel is actually about space and time, and, and there's a lot of math involved, and it's very hard. And so when I get to Saga, I'm like, let's just make stuff up. And they're saying there's a like, magic tree spaceship and stuff. And, no, so uh, I, I wish that I could say that we had an elaborate star map out that, you know, here's where this planet is and it takes this long to get here, but no, we just lie and make stuff up. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, so for yourself, um, Surgeon X is very, seems very carefully designed to be the mirror of this world we're in now. And basically we're a few years away from it, it seems. For yourself, do you have that sort of, do you have that back material in your head, you know, this is the science behind the story and the story has to stand up to that. And that is that, that is quite an important part of the story for you, isn't it? Having that real world scientific knowledge filter into the actual narrative. Quite jealous of Brian saying he got he just made loads of shit up because basically because <laughs> my story you know was really rooted in, in fact and you know I, I like to call it it's in a hyper real world in that it's 20 years time and it's a place that we don't want to go so it's sort of like a, a hypothetical thought experiment if you like what if our antibiotics didn't work what if our character was a slightly sociopathic surgeon who decided who would live and who would die you know all these sort of things were based around conversations I had with scientists, with historians, with ethicists. So yeah, it was very much rooted in the factual world, but also, you know, we wanted it to be entertaining. So there were moments when we were building the story world and having conversations with the brilliant Karen Berger about how far, how far I'd pushed things. But actually, do you know what, speaking to the experts, they were sometimes saying you can push it a bit further, it was that scary. But, but yeah, being authentic, I guess, was kind of part of it, rather than necessarily being absolutely accurate. It was kind of using the real world um, to sort of create a, an authentic story. And uh, Alison, it's not feeding through really nice, this is great, this. Alison, you're an architect, on top of everything else, which is amazing. But um, for yourself, when you're working on something like Windbreaker Graveyard or, or Genesis, you've got that sort of mindset, I suppose, in mind, the design mindset of how buildings actually work. Is that something you actually want in the comics, or do you kind of think, I'm just going to do what I want? No, 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 no. It's, I mean, I mean com comics are like architecture, but the bottom line is, all you're dealing with is the real estate of the page and nothing else, which means it doesn't have to work. In the, it doesn't have to have a whole kind of um, other dimension where, where everything kind of links up and works. So that said, with Winnebago Graveyard, um, I, I built a really, really huge model of the Winnebago Graveyard. I don't know if anyone's read it, but it's like, it's... You had, I, had, I had to build a model of it because it's just lots and lots and lots of vehicles all together, which all had to be drawn really well and properly. Steve wanted to set the comic in the real world near where he lived. And I went out, I, I, I went to see him actually, and he drove me around and showed me. And I found out it was really ugly and kind of boring. And um, <laughs> I set some of it there. But then I thought, actually, we can do better than that. And um, I set some of it somewhere else. In, um, in a real place, but just not there. And, um, and I used Google Earth and photographs and so on. And then, um, so what I did, it was part, part computer construction, part imagination, part real world somewhere, part real world somewhere else, part of what Steve wanted and part of what I'd made up. But the fact is, it doesn't need to work, gravity doesn't apply, it, it doesn't need to work in the real world and it doesn't all have to connect up because you don't know you know, even a room doesn't need to work. You know, it's just, frankly, a series of theatre sets. And um, so, you know, we can take many, 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 many liberties. But also, 
um, perspective isn't not to go on. Perspective is not a thing. It's like we don't look, we don't see like that. So walls can be curved because that's how we see. It, the rules of comics can be what you want them to be, more or less. Which brings us very nicely to Team Stoko, where the rules of walls does not apply <laughs> at all. Um, James, James, so let's take a, a comic you've done fairly recently, like the first issue of Godzilla Goes to Hell. That is, you've done a comic called Godzilla Goes to Hell, just in case you haven't heard, it's amazing. Um, when you think of a concept like that, let's take a giant monster and put her in this situation, and we're going to make it themed around the seven, uh, well, the seven deadly sins, aren't they? Yeah. Well, I didn't think the concept of that that one was uh, thought up by the editor, so... But they gave us each... Well, I, it started off, they were going to do seven issues, like one for each sin, but and I started off with... I think it was Lust. So, in the... Uh, is it Dante's Inferno? They have the Lust as the big... Uh, like a whirlwind of people that's just constantly flying around. So I had that just kind of slam into Godzilla, but he doesn't move because he's Godzilla. <laughs> and yeah, that's just um, trying to think of what this completely odd entity like Godzilla would do in a made up place like hell. It's, it's... <laughs> Is everyone all right? <laughs> I don't know what just happened. Could you hold the microphone closer to your mouth, please? Oh, sorry. Sorry, what was the question? I, I don't remember anymore. Um, <laughs> um, sorry, I'm feeling a bit sorry for you having just skipped to go. Um, so, um, we're talking about Godzilla Goes to Hell, which you, you had the structure of seven issues, but you switched it down to one issue. Oh, yeah, I only did the first issue, so. It was, yeah. it was a different artist each issue. Yeah. So, I just did the first one. But I did a. I tried to keep it self contained but kind of also lead into the next one, because at the beginning he's falling through the pit like into hell from a earth up above. And at the end he falls through the pit again, so it kind of looks like a repeated cycle thing, like he's trapped in hell or something. <laughs> so. So how important is structure to the world building process then? Um, there's, there's a range of different comics here, they've all been told in different lengths. Um, so for example, Saga is going to go on probably forever. Um, I'm assuming, and uh, uh, Winnebago Graveyard has just concluded, so the next just concluded, and Insects just, you've all finished a lot of comics recently. Um, sorry, especially, uh, one thing you've been doing a lot, it seems, over the last few years, is you've got your self-contained stories, um, the, the Spies, it's gone Gorilla, um, Angelic, um, God Shaper, like, you have your story, you, you create your world, then you move on to a new one. Is it useful to have that sort of very tight structure of like, I'm going to do six issues in this world, then move on, when you're actually building it up in your mind. Sorry, um, oh heavens, uh, I could waffle for hours and, uh, yeah, okay, so the short version is, um, I believe that the most important part of a story is the ending, it doesn't necessarily have nearly as much meaning if it doesn't have an ending. Um, I also believe that when I create a world, because I tend to tell quite weird stories about incredibly weird places, and so in order to keep it grounded in some way, um, what I particularly love to do is create a world that feels functional. And, and uh, one of the reasons I could bore you is that one of the things you spend some time thinking about is like economies, and it's funny you were talking about like severed penises and all the rest of it, because if you can, if you can in your mind, and it doesn't even need to be part of the story, if you can create a world that feels as though when you shut the book, when the character's story has ended, when you have achieved meaning, the world persists because it's functioning. It doesn't need the story to exist, it exists in its own right. Then the focus, which is usually on a character's story, can come to an end. You don't need to feel like it must go on and on and on. And so to answer your question, generally speaking, I've created these worlds that feel functional. I want the character story to end. And so, if I ever do ongoings, they, I, I sort of call it modular storytelling because I'm a pretentious prick like that, but it's, it's basically sequels rather than one long perpetual second act. Um, the, the thing I'm just doing now, Angelic, is a little bit different because it, it's, it's sort of intended for younger audiences, so it wasn't so important that the world feel functional. It's far more about 
a free form adventure. You know, through the eyes of a child, everything is wonderful. You don't need to understand it in order for it to be wondrous. So that's a, a departure for me. Probably should have shared the microphones out better, shouldn't I? Um, so that's interesting, actually, that the, uh, the audience um, dictates a little bit of um, who, how your world's created. Um, is that something you will take into consideration when you're working on something? So, uh, for example, the Young Animal Lines, you know that all those books are aimed at mature readers, so you've got probably more places to go. Does it give you, do you feel like there are limitations on working in certain kinds of areas of books, or do you think everything's got its own sort of expanse if you find the right approach, if that makes sense? Well, I mean, it's similar to what he says, uh, where if in Young Animal we know we can get away with just about anything, uh, there are no limits then. I mean, Doom Patrol, we, we sometimes talk about the physics of time travel, but we're also time traveling in an ambulance that can talk and used to be a street and actually becomes a comic at one point in our books. So at that point, we're kind of not, I think I, you almost stop worrying about the logic because the more you explain it, it's not going to work. Um, but if you're working on a Young Ages title, you're, you are going to probably think about your audience and delivering things in a more simple fashion. Um, and then you've got stuff like, I mean, I edit Batman right now, and Gotham is Gotham. And there's not much more you're going to really add to that. You've got the streets to work in. It's, it's like, which, which Batman writer haven't we named the street after yet? It's kind of the hardest question to come up with. So it really just varies. You've got to be amorphous, and it depends on the writer, it depends on the project. And as an editor, it's sort of my job to suss out what that writer needs and how they work and let them do their thing. You've all worked, to some extent, in um, worlds that you don't own. You know, the, the sandbox belongs to someone else, be it um, the world of Doctor Who or the, uh, the Marvel Universe, DC and so on like that. Um, do you find that actually working in uh, uh, someone else's world, is there a bit of freedom in that? Because normally people talk about it being a bit more constricting. But actually, if you're working in, in, in the world of the Avengers, you can do anything. You can create a cyborg horse god, James, uh, and you can make him like the leader of the Avengers. Is it quite, is, is it quite uh, an quite a process sometimes to go, I've got this, this world that exists, I'm going to do something really strange of it and, and shape the world around that. I'm not going to pass the microphone around, let me see if those things might work. Are all guys that like know how the, everything works. Like if you look at Ron Cobb's designs and he shows you how the door locks and it works like that. So that's it's really fun just to go into that and just just draw that and without thinking too much about it. Because my my regular stuff I just it's more uh, just my own stuff. So there's not much thought put into it, <laughs> I guess. Mm. So do, do you find with your own stuff, um, do, you, do you put constraints on that ever at all? Do you ever think, I've gone too far this time? No, no, that hasn't happened yet. Sarah, uh, I'm, gonna come to, I'm jumping around endlessly now, sorry. Sarah, um, for yourself, um, do you find that when you're um, building, building a world now, um, obviously you've come at it from the approach of, I'm going to have the science come into this, it's going to play, it's going to be realistic and authentic. How do you then enter the character of Surgeon X into that world and make her fit into the world that you built? You know, have that idea of, you've got the world, you've got the character, how do they interact with each other and make sense together? I start the other way around in that I came up with the idea of um, the surgeon who the character who sort of lived 20 years in the future because I was interested in sort of the future of medicine and the weird things that people doing and putting inside themselves and adapting themselves and I thought that would be a really interesting world to set a character in, in. And, and so I started with the character, the surgeon and I wanted her to be quite twisted so I wanted her to start as a darling of the NHS 
and then sort of go on this journey where she throws away her Hippocratic oath and, and kind of does things her way. So I started with her and then I built the world around her. So I thought about, you know, what what do you want for your character? You want to throw obstacles at them. You know, what's the worst obstacle you could throw at a doctor? You know, the bedrock of what they work with is antibiotics. If you take those away from them, then that makes it really, really hard. And then so I, I, I sort of, because it was my first comic, they always say write about what you know. So a lot of the stuff that I put in it was based on my experiences or people I knew, or inspired by you know sort of quirky you know scientists or, or, or people I'd met. So then I slowly sort of built her family around her, which is really important to me. So her brother, her twin sister. I have twins. Um, I have brothers with schizophrenia. The character has schizophrenia. And so it was all built around sort of experiences I had. In my life, and I think if it's your first comic, I think writing about you know what you know is probably quite important, and then I guess from there you can kind of get more weird and wonderful. But I certainly constructed it based on on people I know, experiences I've had, and 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 obviously the science journalism came into it as well. So it's a mixture of all those things. Um, Alison, hopefully you didn't base anything on stuff you know when you did Winnebago Graveyard, but um, well. when you, you made this already about working uh, on the book that's set obviously way, way different about the world, different thing to be experienced to yourself. How do you um, grow to understand that world? Do you, do you take in while you're working on the book? Do you listen to like text and music, watch cowboy movies or horror or stuff like that? How do you get into that world? And well, you... well there's, there's, a, there's a certain mindset for horror which I did not get into initially and apparently I've not yet got out of um, where you... Um, Think you, you, you start describing things in a more expressionistic way because largely horror is about feeling and um, stuff you can't quite get a grasp on and um, sometimes it's about things you only half know and sometimes it's about things that like I only half know if that makes sense it, it's um, you, you don't set out to, I, at least I don't set out to scare people deliberately it's if it's creepy it's maybe because um, I'm trying for something that I can't quite put my finger on and I don't quite reach and, um, and that ends up being creepy where something is kind of half done or half known and um, to get into the mindset I mean I do, I, I've enjoyed some good music for this I've, I've enjoyed some nice bluegrass and um, various bits of American music and the kind of thing that they would listen to in the van but you say I don't know about this no, we've all been camping and um, We've got a camper van, and it's pretty much the same. You know, you're in a tin can in a place you don't know, and uh, there's only a very thin metal wall between you and goodness knows what. And um, you know, we took a van around Australia, and we, we camped in the Blue Mountains. And, you know, we don't know who they were out there. We thought they were dumping bodies. So kind of, you know, the, the real world. The real world is far more, far, far, far more scary and horrible than anything we could draw, probably. And um, you know, it's all—it's all out there. I've, I've been camping in Devon, and after that, you can do anything. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Brian, um, for yourself, um, you're currently working on several different stories. Uh, um, saga. I think you just wrapped *We Stand on Guard*. Is that right? And you've got *Hopewells* as well. Um, having those different worlds in tandem at the same time. How do you um, process which book you're working on at a time and which world you're in? Is it difficult to ever start taking rules from one book and putting them into another book and you have to stop and, and, and come back to yourself? Or... I'm, I'm getting old and senile, so I have to have a lot of post-it notes next to my computer about what is that character's name again? And, uh, but no, I, I, try, I find it very hard to work on more than one book in a given week that I like to have. This is my Paper Girls week and I'm just gonna work on that and then switch over to Saga. But it's nice to toggle between, this is my fantasy week, this is my time travel science fiction, this is my political thriller, that um, no, I think it keeps things uh, fresh, so it's a luxury to be able to work on multiple books at once. Uh, I think we're running out of time, is that right? Yes, okay. Uh, I've, uh, I think the last question really is the, the, the very simplest question then, which is, um, what books are you currently working on? What to tell the audience? And where can they find you at Fort Number 2017 if they want to? Uh, I'll pass my mic out of this one. So. Uh, I am in the 
something, Town Hall, the one, the one that's over there, just outside. Uh, table 31, I guess the biggest thing is, I mentioned it before, Angelic, it's a new image book I'm doing. Uh, it is either a very beautiful fable about flying monkeys having adventures in the far future, or it's a uh, quite bittersweet parable about uh, little girls being given choices as they grow up and escaping from depression. So yeah, uh, come and say hello. And uh, I'm in the Comicsology Marquee, table seven in the back corner. Uh, once you get through Brian's line, you can come down and see me at the other end. Uh, I'm doing portfolio reviews all day, so if you have art or you want to come talk to me about stories, uh, I'm sitting there uh, next to Joel Jones, who has Lady Killer prints. And uh, so I'm co-creator of Lady Killer, so I can endorse that as well. Um, I'm in the same marquee as uh, and then Allison as well, um, the Leeds Town Hall. Uh, I just wrapped up Insects with uh, Margaret Bennett, and my next comic is Matahari with Emma Bibi. So come say hi. I still have some um, traits, not traits, issue left from Insects. Uh, I'll be signing from uh, 2 to 5 today over there on that comicsology thing. And uh, other than the books I've plugged, if you want a free comic today, you can go to uh, panelsyndicate.com, which is my digital site. And I've got a weird new book called Barrier just kind of a, a sci-fi take on immigration. So you can read the whole thing for whatever price you think is fair, including nothing. So check it out, thanks. In 150, I'm in the tent opposite the town hall, and I've got all, uh, three comics, basically, that are a template special with beautiful art from War and Police, and I'll be sitting there just giving out comics for free. I'm in the town, court, town hall marquee at number 29, which is um, opposite Ariella and one, two tables up from Sai. And um, I've got the full set right now, um, maybe not later, I've got the full set of the Winnebago graveyard issue. So you get the whole story now before the trade comes out, which it comes out on November the 22nd. And um, yeah, come and, come and, come and see us. Um, it's quite nice in there. I'm right there, <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll be doing sketches and fighting off a of board, so <laughs> find some more. <laughs> Alright, first of all, can I just say a big thank you to Kelly Swift, who has been interpreting the whole uh, panel for us. <laughs> Panelists, uh, James Stoko, Alison Sampson, Sarah Kenny, Brian K. Vaughan, Ariel Christantina, Jamie Swift, and Cy Spinner. Thank you all for coming out.